Morning, church. Uh, today's teaching text is Psalms 146, and I'll be reading from the Christian Standard Bible. It reads as follows. The God of compassion, hallelujah, my soul, praise the Lord. I will praise the Lord all my life. I will sing to my God as long as I live. Do not trust in nobles, in a son of man who cannot save. When his breath leaves him, he returns to the ground. On that day, his plans die. Happy is the one whose help is the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord his God, the maker of heaven and earth, the sea and everything in them. He remains faithful forever, executing justice for the exploited and giving food to the hungry. The Lord frees prisoners. The Lord opens the eyes of the blind. The Lord raises up those who are oppressed. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord protects resident aliens and helps the fatherless and the widow. But he frustrates the ways of the wicked. The Lord reigns forever. Zion, your God reigns for all generations. Hallelujah. My name is Reino. If we have not met before, I have the privilege of serving this church as a pastor and I have the privilege of opening up the word this morning and studying Psalm 146 with you. This is the last Sunday in our series, Stop, Think, Pray, Go. We say to each other in the beginning of the year, before we do New Year, New Me, before we set ourselves a lot of goals that are uh, oftentimes unattainable, let's just stop and let's think and let's pray before we go and let's build this year on a firm foundation. So over the past four Sundays, I've taken you through four Psalms, which I believe carries great truth, which is stuff that you can build your life on uh, in a foundational way this year. We started off this year by saying, I have what I need. God depicted as a shepherd, God depicted as a host. He leads you and he hosts you and he gives you and he showers you with his blessings. The second uh, Sunday, we did Psalm. 139. The theme was I am known. And um, we spoke about this all-knowing, ever-present God who made each and every one of us in our mother's womb. He knows us inside out. There's nothing that he does not know of us. So whether you do feel struck down, despondent, misunderstood, God knows and you are known. Last week, we, um, we looked at Psalm 1. The theme was how to be blessed, and the short version of last week's sermon was how to be blessed uh, means being in the right community and having the right compass, being amongst the right people and feasting on God's word and really enjoying it. And the, our theme for today is a solid start to any day. That's also where question of the day came from. So can I read Psalm 146? Psalm 146 is what is called a solo hymn. It was written by a person. It's written as a song and it's meant to be sung. And it speaks of Yahweh, the God of Israel, in the third person, which means I'm writing down something because I want to tell you about someone. Let's sing it, right? That's Psalm 146. That's where it came from. The structure of the hymn is really, really easy. It's a call to praise, and then it gives you the reason why God is being praised. Okay? So, hallelujah is a conjunction of two words. Hallelujah, which means you praise, and Yah, which is short for Yahweh. So, you praise Yahweh. That's what hallelujah means. And this uh, psalm starts with hallelujah, and it ends with hallelujah. So, it is a call to praise. And in this psalm, we see that the reason why God is being praised is because of His work in creation. I love, great is thy faithfulness, as we sung through God creating all things. So, it's God's work in creation and God's work in history works the same with us in musical worship, right? That's exactly what somebody did. She sat down, and then she called us to praise. Let us praise. Okay. Let me show you a structure for the song. Then you've got a road map for where we are headed. I did this uh, the uh, last three weeks, and I've gotten good feedback from it. So there you go. Here's how the song all fits together. It's a commitment to praise Yahweh from the person who wrote it. I will praise the Lord all my days. Second part of the psalm speaks about true faith in Yahweh, and it speaks about Yahweh being a powerful king. Okay, remember I said, uh, calling you to praise, here are the reasons why we're praising God, and this is one of the reasons, is because he is a powerful king. Third part of it 
Yahweh's providential help of faithful Israel. Remember Israel, this is what God has done for us in the past. Let us not forget it. Let us remain faithful to Him because He has remained faithful to us. And then the last part of the psalm is all about Yahweh's everlasting kingly power. Now, the name of God, Yahweh, given to Him by Him in Exodus chapter 3, gets used nine times in this psalm. Whenever you see the name Yahweh in any portion of Scripture, you should hear a first name. You should hear a personal connection. Okay? You should hear that the person speaking, or in this instance the person writing, knows the one they speak of. Okay? So it's not God, it's Yahweh, the one who has a name, the one who I have a relationship with. And that's significant. That's why I also like the songs that San Marie chose. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to take this structure and we're going to nail all four of them. Are you guys okay with it? So let's start with the first one. A commitment to praise Yahweh. This is someone singing in front of a congregation. Okay? And his singing in front of a congregation invites people to turn their hearts to do the same. The fact that this person speaks to, uh, about Yahweh in the third person means that this person is testifying. It is a testimony. And here's what I love about a testimony. Just tell me what happened. A testimony doesn't have to be a sermon. A testimony doesn't have to be an argument. A testimony is a version of a story of how you experienced it. How was Friday night? Tell me about it. And this psalm writer says, I want to tell you about my relationship with Yahweh. And then he says, I'm determined to do this for the rest of my life because I know that he will do it to me for the rest of my life. And the way I know it is because I have a, con a conscious, regular relationship with him. Look at verse um, 2 again. He speaks of my God. Do you guys see it? This is really, really important. I'm going to circle back to it later. So I know him. I'll do this my whole life. And the way that I want you to know that I know him is because I call him my own God. Now guys, think about this. We experienced this in a small way this morning with someone taking to music, praising God, and then calling us to do the same. The psalm writer witnesses about his relationship with God, and in his witnessing calls the people to consider it to do the same. Do you guys realize that our own commission, our own sentness to speak to people about our relationship with God works in the same way. We are called to witness. We are called to share. We are called to tell. We are called to speak. All of us are not called to, ex uh, uh, to do the exposition of the scriptures like I do this morning. All of us are not called to argue the basic tenets of the Christian faith. But all of us are called to tell people about your relationship with God. And guys, if you have a relationship with God that is personal, that is edifying, it strengthens you, that is encouraging, that is revitalizing your life, how can you not tell someone about it? So we should stop for a second here and look at the psalm and go, whoa, whoa, whoa. We want to say to this guy, preach, preach, preach. But this psalm is also saying back to us, preach, preach, preach. Like tell the story. Do we have a burden for lost people? I have to ask that question in these first two verses. On Friday morning, I was part of a prayer gathering. And in the prayer gathering, the guy who facilitated it said, write down the names of five people now who are unsaved who you can pray for. And I sat down and I started making a list and I stopped when I had nine. The problem is that I haven't prayed for any of those nine during the past week. I mean, I thought about them. And even with some of these nine, I had interactions with them. And I was really friendly with them and I asked out about them, but I did a purpose. To none of these nine people did I say, dude, I have to tell you, at this moment I'm reading the Psalms and it is changing my life. And here's how it is changing my life. I didn't do it. And I'm praying for them now, but I felt this burden for lost people, which led me to what should I do with lost people, which led me to the Psalm that says, just tell the story. So this is how this Psalm starts. I want to show you guys, just real quick, I forgot about that slide. Uh, if you can just go back to the slide that divides up uh, the psalm book for me, please, Rudolf. I want you guys to see 
that Psalm 146 is part of a collection of psalms all the way at the end of the psalm book. Okay, It might be a little bit too small for you to see, but just look at it again. Psalm 1 and 2, all the way on the left, introduction to the book, and Psalm 146 to 150, this great conclusion to the book. And in between, there's this whole story of uh, God's law, of His Messiah uh, being sent. Uh, there's uh, Psalms of lament, and there's Psalms of praise, there's Psalms of faith, and there's Psalms of hope. And at the end, after considering all of this, taking all of this into account, this writer says, regardless of where I am, hallelujah, I will commit to praising God all my days. Really, really important. So this guy didn't just have a good day and decide to write a song. This guy took into account this whole story and said, there's reason to praise God and I'll do it my whole life. Okay. So that's the first part. A commitment to praise Yahweh, or Yahweh, sorry, <laughs> which is a witnessing commitment and we should have the same. Let's look at the second part. True faith in Yahweh as a powerful, powerful king. So you'll see three words as you work through the psalm. You'll see help, you'll see trust, and you'll see power. And in the second part of the psalm, uh, these themes are being explored. It's explored twice. First, negatively. This isn't who you should trust, or who will help you, or who has power, and then positively. Okay, now here's what I want you to see. Just keep your Bible open and look at verses 3 to 6 again. The writer says, the qualities that he's praising Yahweh for are qualities that foreign human rulers cannot have. Now remember, this person is somewhere in history. He's under the rule of someone. He's in a specific place, and he has a specific message. So in this specific place, he writes this specific message in this poem, and he experiences certain things as he writes it. That's where this writer sits. And he says, no one who has authority over me, no one who has ever had authority on earth, and no one who will ever have authority on earth, no kings or rulers can be like Yahweh. Why? Because they were made by him. Okay? Uh, the, the, uh, I found a word in, in one of the commentaries I read this week. Creatureliness. It's quite cool. <laughs> so the commentary says, the creatureliness spells the transience of their policies. Okay? They can't last forever, so their decisions can't last forever. They've got power now, but they cannot hold on to it always. So from a long-term standpoint... This writer says that human rulers are powerless. And because they're powerless, they also can't bring salvation. Now remember, the expectation of the people in Israel is that the Savior will come, that the Messiah will come, that there will be a king that will set everything right. We'll get back to that a little bit later. This psalm writer says it will not be worldly rulers. Salvation cannot come from a human being on earth, obviously, unless it's God who became human, but we'll get there a little bit later. Do not trust in them. They will not last. They do not have the power that they promise. So the writer puts in a negative way what you should not trust in, so that he can help you then to describe what trust in God looks like. And here's what he says. Yahweh is Israel's true king. He's the God of Jacob. He's the one who in history always did what he said he will do. And he has all the help and all the power and all the salvation that earthly rivals lack. Well, let me say it differently. Trust in Yahweh as your own God will never disappoint you. That's what he says. So he says, I'll praise God all of my life. I know him. Here's what you shouldn't do. And here is what you should do. And then what will you be? Happy. Anyone from last week picking up that word? Remember last week we spoke about Psalm 1 starting with happy is the man or blessed is the man. Verse 5 says in Psalm 146, happy is the one whose help is the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord his God. So if you want to trust anyone, if you want to uh, depend on someone's power, if you need help from someone, make that someone God himself, the God of Israel. And then you will be happy. 
Remember last week, I also quoted Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount, in the beginning of Matthew chapter 5, who says to people, happy are you when? And then he speaks about their lives in the kingdom of God, and how God describes these happy people. When you look at it at first glance, you think, why on earth would those who have tears now be happy? Well, because God will one day dry their own tears. Why are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness happy now? Well, it's because they will inherit the kingdom one day. So even in a state that doesn't look ideal, if you look at it from a human perspective, you will still be blessed. And this writer says exactly the same. Remember, he's at the end of the psalm book, uh, Israel is still in exile. They haven't returned back to what they knew. All God's promises hasn't yet been fulfilled, but he says, you are still happy if this is the God you trust in. Blessed will you be. So Yahweh has the power. And how do we know? Because he created everything. He gets stuff done. He's always been, he is now, and he always will be. And that is the opposite of all the earthly earthly rulers with which he has been um, compared up until this point. Do you guys remember in Psalm 139, I spoke about the love that a creator has for his creation. And do you guys see that this psalm writer is picking up those themes again? So in Psalm 139, it says that God loves you because he created you. In Psalm 146, he says, let's praise God who created everything because that means that he loves everything and that he will help and that we can trust in him with all things. This is a, uh, uh, it brings comfort. It brings security to us to know that the one who made us also cares for us. And remember, if you live in a society, it's called an agrarian society where people work with their hands, you take great pride in what you made because you can actually physically see it, Right? I only type emails with my hands, well, and sermons, but I can't really see the product, right, unless I actually print it out and I go, yeah, yeah, this is a solid sermon. Whereas in a society where people make stuff with their hands, it's on display for everyone. So now the writer of this psalm says Yahweh has the power because he created everything and he loves everything. Can I just for a second quote probably one of the most quoted verses in the Bible, John chapter 3, verse 16, which says, For God so loved the world. Which points to this. Okay, so the world, the cosmos, everything we know, everything he created, he loved. How do we know this? Because he created everything. The maker of heaven and earth, the sea, and everything in them. Now I want to show you something. This is a nerd alert, okay? We're going to dive into Hebrew words now. So focus. But I want to show you this because it's absolutely brilliant poetry. You guys are familiar with wordplay? Sometimes people call it word gymnastics, okay? Wordplay means using specific words that are connected with one another to convey a deeper message. Now just look at this slide. Um, Rudolf, it's the one that has the text in red of verses 3 and 4. If you can just go to that one for me, please. So there's unbelievable wordplay here between son of man, bain adam, and ground, adama. And there's wordplay between breath, ruach, and plans, also ruach. And then there's an absolute ripper buried in the word die. I'll tell you more about that now. Here's what the psalm writer says. You are a son of the earth. You are earthling. You are dust. And that's why you return to dust. Okay? So he speaks about the temporary nature of humanity. You guys all know the verse, from dust you came into dust you shall return. And breath, ruach, is the same Hebrew word that gets used in Genesis 1 when it says God breathed over creation. It's the same word that gets used in Genesis 2 when it says God breathed into Adam's nostrils. My word. I use a nose spray that is eucalyptus infused. And when I go, I go, woo, that's quite a rush. Can you guys imagine what your nostrils must feel like if God blows into them, right? So, Ruach in Genesis chapter 1, it belongs to God. Ruach in Genesis chapter 2, it belongs to God, but he gave it to humanity. Now he says, God will take back what he gave you, because it is his. None of us can breathe without God ordaining it. So now he uses poetry to say, dust, dude, and dust again. 
and you didn't ever breathe on your own, and God will take it back one day, and then everything you're thinking will also die because he's going to take that back too. And then he uses a perfect form of the verb die, which means dead, dead, really dead, like no return. That's what he says. So he says, um, do not trust in human beings or rulers that are not God because they were made from dust, they'll return to dust. Whatever they, ever, whatever they ever had, God gave them. It will eventually leave them all, and there's no turning back. That's the temporary nature of humanity. It's beautiful poetry now, isn't it? Did you guys know that the earth is called Adama, and that the first name was called Adam, right? Beautiful wordplay there, because he was made from the earth. So I'm curious to ask the question at this point, what do you spend your time on during a day? And how does that show what you put your trust in? Okay, because that's the point that the writer makes. The writer makes the big point. True faith should be put in Yahweh because he is a powerful king. And I just want to ask you that question at this point. What do you put your trust in? And if you think about how you spend your time in a day, what does that show about what you trust in? Now, I don't have to go on a rough to tell you how overloaded we are and how, much, or how many messages come to us in a day and how unbelievably indoctrinating social media and the interwebs can be. Like, we live in 2022, guys. All of us know that. I'm just asking, who are you lending your ears to? And what are you focusing on? And what is coloring the lens with which you look at the earth? Because you can pick up a newspaper, and the newspaper can tell you that our economy is about to crash and we are all going to die. Or you can pick up the Bible that says everything that is created was created by God, and he'll care for them, and you should put your trust in him. You have to make that decision. And you have to choose on which one you are going to focus, which will eventually help you to put your trust into that person. Well, let me say it differently. If you hit the socials first thing in the morning, is hallelujah the first thing that you see? I don't know. I don't know about your algorithms. I don't even have social media. So I don't hit social media first thing in the morning. But if you don't see hallelujah first thing in the morning, you've missed your chance. Because starting your day with hallelujah is the best start to any day. And you should start it with hallelujah and you should end it with hallelujah. That's what the psalmist or the writer of this psalm calls us to. How do you start your day? Let's look at the third point. Yahweh's providential help of faithful Israel. Now look at this. The psalm writer now introduces people into the fold. And he does this to show that this God who can be trusted, who rules over everything, who should be praised, still cares for people. And he writes it to his own people to strengthen them to say, God has not forgotten the various afflictions that you are in and the fact that you are socially marginalized, the fact that you are currently weak, the fact that you are struggling politically, the fact that you are struggling economically. God knows all of this. Look, he's going to fix it. He is the one that will provide that providential help and he is the one that will execute justice. Guys, any of us who care about anyone who rules over us from local government all the way to the world wants them to do the right thing so that all people can flourish, right? Like that's my heart. If I pray for our governance and for our politicians, I pray that they would serve the people and that they would make decisions for the flourishing of all people, and that they would care and have compassion for people, that they would execute justice, that they, that they would make sure that everyone has what they need, and that they would make sure that everyone is in the right relationship with one another. That is what a king or a ruler or authority is supposed to do. And now this psalm writer says, the only one that could ever live up to those expectations or ideals is Yahweh himself. Because those are the ideals of kingship, right? Um, executing justice, giving food and freedom, blessing people, leading them to wholeness, defending them. Like that is the ideals of kingship. This writer says there's only one king like that, and his name is Yahweh. So he'll do it. And not only will he do it, he will also uphold his side of the covenant. He will make sure that he never uh, takes a step back on the promises he made. 
And he tells this whole story to show Israel, or to show the people listening to him, that God has done this from generation to generation. Guys, we have to take a note of this. This psalm writer says, He has done this always. Verse 10 says, For all generations. God has always done this, and He will always do it. When we had needs, He gave to us. When we were in need of resources, He gladly gave it to us. And therefore, we should praise Him, and we should praise Him forever. Now, let's just take a moment here and consider the Gospel. When this writer wrote Psalm 146, Jesus, hasn't came, Jesus has not come to earth at that point. They were still expecting that God will come through on his promises because he said that he will never flout his promises and that he'll always come through on it. And they were waiting for this king. They were waiting for this ruler. They were waiting for this salvation. Guys, we stand on the other side of the New Testament. It actually happened in Jesus. Like the second theme running through the whole book of Psalm that says, just bring us a king that is worthy of being a king, actually happened. God became a human being, and in becoming a human being, he executed justice, he worked righteousness, he gave everyone what they needed, he made sure that we can be in right relationship with God and in right relationship with one another, he showed us a way of life, he taught us what the law expects of us, and then he came to dwell in us through his Holy Spirit after his ascension. Do you guys know the little paragraph we read at the beginning of every sermon? Life Death, resurrection, ascension, well, birth it starts with. It's because this whole story reveals God to us in a way that we can say, look, he does keep his promises. He said he'll do it, and he did. No earthly ruler can keep to his promises in the way that God did. And for us as Christians, whatever it is that's bogging us down at the moment, and whatever we worried about, we have the assurance that God did the greatest act of, act of salvation that He ever promised to do, and therefore He will restore all things. Because He rules over all things. We read in the New Testament that Jesus now sits at the right hand of the Father, and He carries the title, Pantokrator, which means the Almighty. He sees everything, and no one can ever supersede His power. So we need to hang in there, we need to trust Him, we need to trust in His power, and we need to ask Him for help, because He will do it. And we need to stick it out, from now until forever. That's what the psalm writer says. And then in verse 10, he says, Yahweh's everlasting kingly power. Now, he brings to completion help, trust, and power. And he says, if you, if you, wanna, if you need help, if you want to trust in anyone, if you want to see power, it's all found in God. And then he gives us this reassurance that it will happen forever. I want to show you one line from Exodus. Exodus 15, verse 18. So this is a song of Moses in the book of Exodus right after the Israelites crossed the Red Sea. He goes, oh, 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 I need, to, I need to write a song here. And look what he says. The Lord, that's Yahweh, will reign forever. This psalm was written probably 700 years after this song was sung. And what does it say? He will reign forever. And then Jesus came to earth, and he ascended, and he's seated at the right hand of the Father, doing what? Reigning forever. And then you read the book of Revelation, and what does it say? He will be on the throne forever. And what will he do? He will restore, he will bring blessing back. He's always done it. From Genesis 3, he promised and said, I will crush the head of the serpent. In Genesis 12, he says, I will... Uh, I will give blessing back unto the earth. In Isaiah 53, he says, I will take the punishment so that you don't have to. And he did all of it. He was Emmanuel. He gave his spirit to us. He made us his temple. He dwelt with us. Like every single thing God has ever promised, he did. And therefore, we can have the confidence that he will do it again. And then the psalm writer says in verse 10, if you can just put that back up for me, please, Rudolf. He says, Zion... Your God reigns for all generations. Praise Him now. That's what the word hallelujah means. Now Zion is a cinnamon, a, a cinnamon, a synonym for a worshiping community. 
If I were to translate this into today in South Africa, I would say, Church, your God reigns for all generations. Now let's give him a hallelujah. That's what I would have translated it as because that's what he says here. Okay. Now what is, the, what is this writer doing? He proclaims old truths to a new generation of God's people because they need it. They need to hear this. The psalm was written in a period of low morale. And in this period of low morale, they are urged to rededicate themselves to God. Why? Because God has been their help in ages past. And if they entrust themselves to this faithful creator, he will be um, he, their help again. Check this one. If faith is refueled, then praise is rekindled. You guys know the saying, that's just fuel to the fire? If you want to have your praise burn, then the fuel on it is faith. Do you guys see it? So this writer writes the psalm so that these people can be refueled, so that their praise can be rekindled, so that the power of God can become known to all people who they sing it to, and that they have to stay loyal to Him because He has the destiny of His covenant people, of His covenant people, in His hands. Now, guys, last week we had a we had a, a preaching team meeting. Myself, Lassa Homer, and Denny and Shiami. And uh, we just asked the question, where's our people at? Like, what are we sensing? What are people saying? What are they praying for? What are they sharing in city group? And guys, I have to say that we are acutely aware of the fact that we have a low morale at the moment. And that's why we are preaching sermons like this, is to refuel your faith so that your praise can be rekindled. We just feel like the Word has the ability to rekindle us. The Word has the ability to get us out of the survival mode ditch we are in at the moment and put praise back on our lips. I think humanity did well in two years of the pandemic to survive. But guys, I don't know about you. It feels to me like we're still a little bit in survival mode. <clears throat> and I really believe that Jesus is calling the church out of survival mode. Back to praise. Because He didn't fail us over the last two years now, did He? And he hasn't failed us in generations past, and he also will not fail us in generations to come. He brought us here to plant this church to be good news. We will not be good news if we just survive and think of ourselves. It's time to be built up and to be strengthened. And we said as a preaching team, the best way to do it is to break open the Word of God. I mean, if it's dependent on the way I speak or the cool images we use, it will never get you to that place. But God's Word has the power to transform us in that way. So if Israel had a moment of low morale, and this is what the psalm writer said to them, then I want to say exactly the same to you today. If we are at a place of low morale and struggle, let us throw faith as fuel onto our fire of praise, and it'll be rekindled. Do you know where it starts? And I'll land with this. It starts with you grabbing the gift of faith. I said earlier that we'll circle back to this. So check me, circling back to this. Look at verse 1. Verse 1 says, My God. It's a possessive pronoun. You have taken it. How will you guys know that this is my cell phone? I am taking it. Mine. Possessing it. Knowing it. Using it. Three possessive pronouns in this psalm is used. My God in the beginning. So I'm going to tell you about the one I know. And then his God in verse 5. So the believer who sets his hope on Yahweh sets his hope because he's his God. He has taken it. He has appropriated it to himself. And then look at verse 10. The worshiping community assembled at Zion is related to Yahweh as your God. You guys see how this poet nails home the fact <clears throat> that you have to take a hold of this. You have to believe this and you have to work with it. Make it yours. One of the easiest moments in evangelism for me is to speak about the gift of faith and the grip of faith. There's a couple of people in the crowd who I taught this in Afrikaans. We always spoke about the gave in die grip. The gift and the grip. It's how faith works. And the way you grip the gift is by placing your faith in it. It's there for all of us. I am telling you now that the creator of the universe can be your God. 
I don't know if you guys have ever picked that up when Sanaba, the leader of our prayer ministry, prays. She always starts with, my God. Have you guys heard it? And then when she does, I go, mm, 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 mm. pray now, sister, pray now. Because she knows him. You can also. And he should be your God. He should be his God. He should be my God. It's possible for us. Grab it and don't miss it. Because it's there for the taking. So if you've never placed your trust in Jesus, now is a phenomenal time to do it. Because I really don't know how much more information or nudging you need. Just take it. If you know God, but this my God scratches you a little bit, then start your day with a hallelujah. That's where you should start. That is where this whole life of trust and faith and being rekindled in praise starts. As it starts with a hallelujah. I'll end with this remark. What I love about Jewish spirituality is that the Psalms are part of their everyday life. If you are Orthodox Jew or practicing Jew, you'll read at least three Psalms a day. You'll read one in the morning, you'll read one in the afternoon, and you'll read one in the evening. Psalm 146 is a morning psalm. You have to read it, if you're an Orthodox Jew, before 6.30. Because if you don't, your day has started without saying hallelujah. I want to challenge us as a church to start our days like this, this year. We said we'll stop, we'll think, we'll pray, and we'll go. What I'm asking of you in the last sermon in this series is to stop and to think and to say hallelujah, and then to go. And I'm sure that that will rekindle our faith, and that will rekindle our praise. And we will have more reasons, consciously, to praise God than we would have had before. Because our eyes will be focused in the beginning of each day in the right way. Let me pray for us. Father God, to just come to terms with the fact that I can call you Father and that I can call you my Father is too big for my head and it is too big for my heart. To think that the one who has always been, the one who is now and the one who will always be loves me, knows me, hosts me, blesses me, leads me, shows me, corrects me, revitalizes me, I want to break out in a psalm and just say, Hallelujah. So, Father God, this morning, that's the word on our lips. We want to praise you for who you are and for what you've done. We want to praise you because we have put our faith in you uh, in a new way this morning. We want to praise you in the morning. We want to praise you in the evening. We want to start with Hallelujah and we want to end with Hallelujah. We want to build our lives on this foundation this year. May you be praised, Father God through our lives. May you be made known, Lord Jesus, to the world through our witness. Strengthen us. Pull us out of this low morale. Click us out of survival mode, Holy Spirit. We want to be used to see your kingdom come in this place. I pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.